everyone, and welcome to our day five plenary at the Global South Women's Forum. Today's plenary is titled The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, Climate Change, COVID-19, and the Green New Deal. Before we begin, and I turn my duties over to the moderator, uh, I just have a few housekeeping rules that I'd like to go through for everyone. This session provides interpretation. To, cho to choose interpretation, please go to the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and choose your language channel, whether that's English, Spanish, or Portuguese. Do mute original audio to only hear the interpreter. Welcome to GSWF 2021. As participants, please turn off your videos and mute your microphones. If you're experiencing slow bandwidth, please close any unnecessary programs or applications on your device. Feel free to use the public chat box to engage with one another or with our panelists throughout the session. This session is being live streamed on ERA Asia Pacific's Facebook page and the recording will be available publicly afterwards. ERA Asia Pacific is committed to making GSWF 2021 an inclusive and safe digital environment and will not tolerate harassment of any kind, including but not limited to deliberate intimidation or sustained disruption of discussion. Participants are obliged to be respectful and to avoid replicating societal prejudices and inequalities. Participants who engage in disruptive behavior may be removed without prior notice. With this, I turn duties over to Priyanthi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Priyanthi Fernando. I am the Executive Director of Euro Asia Pacific, and I have great pleasure in welcoming you to this final day of the Global South Women's Forum 2021 and to this plenary session on the rise of disaster capitalism, climate change, COVID-19, and the Green New Deal. Throughout this forum, we have heard from women in Asia, the Pacific, Africa, the Caribbean, and Latin America about how corporations have impacted on global South women's lives in different ways. Disrespecting their rights, increasing the vulnerability of their families and their livelihoods, and capturing states and preventing governments from protecting their citizens by putting profit before planet or people. In the plenary today, we have three fabulous speakers who will talk about yet another aspect of corporate power that constrains our quest for environmental justice, disaster capitalism. Disaster capitalism, the way I understand it, occurs when private or corporate interests take advantage of major destabilizing events, such as war, political upheaval, and natural disasters. Um, I came across the term almost two decades ago when Naomi Klein published The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. Klein was initially reacting to reconstruction efforts after war. And she saw disaster capitalism as an extension of the military industrial complex. But in subsequent years, in the subsequent decades, we have seen corporates use natural disasters and the climate crisis as opportunities for profit making. And if we had any doubt about this phenomenon, I think we could take COVID-19 pandemic as an example about how much profit was made by corporations and the world's billionaires on the back of COVID-19. Our three panelists will help expand and unpack our understanding of this phenomenon and the solutions that are being proposed. Solutions like the Green New Deal, is this disaster capitalism in another guise? Or is this a mechanism that gives us hope? So before 
uh, we start, let me first introduce them. Uh, we have three uh, fabulous women. Uh, Kavita Naidu is an international human rights lawyer from Fiji and Australia, specializing in climate justice, gender and security. She works with grassroots women in all their diversity from Asia and the Pacific to build a feminist climate justice movement. Currently, Kavita is working as a consultant engaged in feminist participatory action research in Fiji and Kiribati with the Edith Cohen University and Plan International Australia. And in the Mekong region with Oxfam Australia. Kavita has published and presented widely on the gender impacts of the climate crisis, move, crisis on movement building, development justice, and COVID-19 recovery. Kamita is a non-executive director at Greenpeace Australia Pacific. She also represents the women and gender constituency at UNFCCC. Thanks Kavita for being with us this morning. We also have from Africa, Melania Chiponda, uh, who is an African eco-feminist uh, hailing from Zimbabwe, I believe, whose environmental justice and climate justice work within the extractive sector stretches over 20 years of defending lands, territories, and women's dignity and human rights. Melania is a feminist researcher and educator with a wealth of experience uh, working in the academic field where she has worked with the Women's University in Africa's Gender and Transformative Studies Department, while at the same time having the expertise to use liberating feminist policy, popular education to build collective knowledge and movements uh, with women land defenders across Africa. As a feminist researcher, her approach is embedded in feminist participatory methodology that brings out women's experience, stories, and struggles to contribute towards the liberation of women. Thanks, Melania, for being with us. And uh, it's, I know it's really early in the morning for you, so we really appreciate it. And last, and definitely not least, we have fellow Jean Anumo from AWID, the Association of Women's Rights and Development. Fellow Jean is a Pan-African feminist who is passionate about using her creativity, politics, and intellect to strengthen feminist movements to build collective power. She leads AWID's feminist bailout and economic recovery plans, which aim to bring together feminist and social justice movements to rethink reimagine and demand the recentering systems, recentering of systems of care in our economies and our, in our ecologies. Thank you, for, uh, fellow Jean, for being with us. I have three, uh, three questions uh, for the panelists, but I will start with two of them, two questions first. Uh, firstly, I would like to know from all three of you, how is disaster capitalism manifesting itself in the climate crisis and in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in your local and regional contexts and what it has it proved to you? Um, when you talk about that, could you also tell us how disaster capitalism has seduced our Global South leaders and governments and has led them to capitalize on the disruption experienced by Global South countries in post-natural disasters. So those are the uh, two questions initially that we I would like you to speak to. And I was just wondering whether Melania, you could go first. Um. Thank you very Thank you. much, uh, Priyank. And um, I would like to um, give uh, an example of the case of the most recent uh, cyclone Idai that hit uh, Southern Africa. 
uh, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Malawi, South Africa, and the, and, um, uh, the countries in the, in the SADC region. Uh, more than 2,000 people uh, died and several hundreds of thousands were left homeless. And uh, for me, it is the, the way that women were disproportionately affected, that um, the, the way this uh, disaster was, was presented, it was firstly presented as a natural phenomenon. And I struggle with that because I don't believe that uh, climate-induced disasters are natural. They have a cause which is embedded in capitalism as a mode of production and um, the capitalist thinking. And the first violence which I see with uh, the climate-induced disasters is how they are defined and how they are presented and how women continue to be invisible. And I think that only presents a, 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 a challenge because when that is presented as something that was unavoidable, that is normal and uh, which is justified as a natural event which was beyond the control, then I see how we, we actually experienced how the reconstruction, the rebuilding, and even the rehabilitation of people that were directly impacted was corporate driven. And even the attitudes around how do we deal with post uh, post-traumatic stress disorders that women are facing, it was resolved in a way that was objectifying women, putting them as, you know, uh, as, 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 as objects uh, which are supposed to be healed by a system that had caused the disaster. And the challenge is that all this is now within this whole global system that has become normal, that corporations can come in as uh, 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 psychologists, corporates are coming in to do the, the construction of roads or social services. It is all privatized. And I have seen this as well uh, at some point when, when we visited New Orleans. Uh, just talking to um, uh, what, are, uh, what, what are often uh, considered, you know, people of color. I was talking to some of the women, trying to understand how countries in the global north are dealing with, um, with the, 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 the impacts of Hurricane Katrina some years after that. And what I heard was actually very problematic. And uh, this uh, sister I was talking to you, to, uh, I was talking to, indicated to me that the the government was actually saying, you know, the reconstruction was supposed people were supposed to have had insurance, their properties were supposed to be insured, and this was quite shocking for me, in the sense that they are pushing people to invest in capitalist driven uh, solutions that if you fail to engage with insurance companies, then when you lose, you just lose. And I'm going to end it here so that others can also come in, but these two cases for me presents uh, the extremes of capitalism, and now given the COVID-19, the, the, the climate crisis, which I, 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 I struggle because it, it's taken as two crises, when in actual fact, this is one. We have one crisis which is feeding into each other, which is um, further marginalizing uh, uh, women in the global south, and uh, which now looking at the climate crisis, it is being pushed to the periphery 
and um, uh, in a way which is saying now it is also a, a chance for the corporates within the health sector to, to profit out of this pandemic and how this whole politics around vaccines and how I see the knowledge of people being stolen and packaged as if, you know, all these corporations came up with this vaccine and, you know, we are supposed to, to give credit to them. But I have seen everyone coming together in, in this pandemic and then all of a sudden, some corporations, they own the vaccines, they own the knowledge, and this is packaged in a way which is protecting profits and the climate crisis is being put aside. And I know that it is going to be brought forward at a convenient time when uh, other corporations can come in or even the same corporation can come in and then profit out of it. And uh, yeah, I, I will leave it here uh, and, and take it forward later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mela. I really think that point about natural disasters, are they really natural? Uh, or can we just attribute them purely to uh, weather conditions or acts of God, as some would, people would say, is a really important point because we know that many of them are being brought on by our own actions, uh, humans' actions. I was just wondering if, um, Kavita, you could also say how this pans out in the uh, Asia and Pacific regions, how this disaster capitalism manifests itself and how is it, uh, how can you, how do you see it in your work in the region? Thanks, Priyanthi. I think I'll build on, um, you know, what Mela started touching on in terms of the vaccine apartheid that we're seeing globally. Um, so, as we all know, you know, the pandemic saw Western countries using all their power and influence to hoard vaccines, while those in the global south, particularly our regions, um, you know, the governments were really busy trying to negotiate how to suspend debt servicing so that they could develop or even afford to buy these vaccines. You know, the rapid global response of pouring money and resources to developing the vaccine in a just world should have been without profit and equitably distributed, but that hasn't happened. Um, what we find is that, you know, major corporations such as Pfizer and AstraZeneca are prioritizing profits. Um, so India and South Africa proposed a waiver of patents and IP rights to WTO last year. So that this, this would enable developing countries to produce its own vaccines at lower costs. Um, you know, the rich countries and these large pharmaceuticals were asked to collaborate for research and development to transfer technology and to support manufacturing, scaling up and supply. But this didn't happen. Instead, what these rich countries and the pharmaceutical companies that are headquartered there have undermined global immunization. So they, you know, most of these global North countries, including the UK and Switzerland, rejected waiving the patent rights. Um, so these pharmaceutical companies have a monopoly on producing these vaccines. And we all know that they've, you know, WHO has actually said that 87% of these vaccines have gone to the world's wealthiest countries. And by contrast, low-income countries have received 0.2% of that supply, less than 1% going into sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa. And then, you know, we had the G7 summit last, um, a couple of months ago, and they've, they've decided that they will donate a billion of these COVID um, vaccines to poor countries. But what WHO asked for was 11 billion. And so this, this really shows how our global economic capitalist structure, you know, which is working in collusion between the governments and corporations, continues to undermine how we in the global south are able to not only vaccinate our populations equitably, but to actually have a sustainable and just recovery. Um, so 
and, and this is the irony, like this gross disparity with the COVID vaccines has happened before with the HIV drugs. It's the same capitalist pattern that's repeating itself now with COVID. Um, and so how this is going to uh, affect COP26, which as many of you know, is the largest climate negotiations in our calendar year, is that because the vaccine distribution has been so inequitable and developing countries and countries in our region are really suffering from facing a, a, an urgent public health emergency. You can't expect global South countries um, to participate in a way in these negotiations that are going to be anywhere remotely inclusive or representative of uh, the, the, the priorities, the climate priorities of our region. Um, you know, the, the same countries with the lowest rates of vaccine are the ones that are most in need of, of support, climate, you know, through climate finance and so forth. Um, but right now, the public health emergency is in fact becoming a larger threat to how they can even prioritize the climate crisis within their countries, right? So how do you expect Global South countries to now submit more ambitious NDCs or transition into a low carbon economy because of you know, the, the, the current crisis that they're facing. And Mela is absolutely right. These are intersecting crises having the same root um, causes through you know, patriarchal capitalist and neo model, neoliberal economic models. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish by just saying um, one other point. It's that you know, the global recession that's arisen by reason of the pandemic has limited access to climate funds that these countries in our region need. Um, you know, many African countries have actually reported that the much needed money targeted towards climate adaptation has actually been diverted to deal with the economic fallout from the pandemic. Um, and, you know, only 3% of international climate finance is actually re reaching Africa while they're um, up to only 0.2% of vaccination rate. So this is really how, you know, capitalism manifests itself in, in really just exacerbating gross inequalities um, in our region. Thanks, Kavita. I think it's, uh, uh, thank you for building on that and for showing us that disaster capitalism is not just um, uh, uh, an issue of a few corporations, uh, capitalizing or taking advantage of a situation, but much more of uh, a glo uh, global systemic global system, right? That uh, has uh, is built on capitalist principles and on exploitation in general. Uh, and then finally, to uh, on this, these two questions uh, to fellow Jane, how does disaster capitalism? manifest itself in the areas in which you work and uh, how do you see um, national uh, governments co-opted into this system and uh, what are the challenges you see in there? 100% and thanks for the panel and totally agreeing with Mela and Kavita on the points and building on that I think I would say two things. One, that this um, uh, period of the climate crisis, um, the COVID pandemic and the last one and a half years has really proved that corporate impunity needs to be tamed. You, you know, from the pandemic profiteers who have made exponential amounts of wealth during the past one and a half years. When you talk about trillionaires, um, where I come from in Kenya, it is even hard to fathom how many zeros are there. You actually lose people when you start to explain that people are going towards being dollar billionaires to the big farmer who hold on to and are profiting off of public funded intellectual property technologies like Kavita has highlighted, to oil and gas companies who continue to pour millions of dollars to solve the adoption of legally binding uh, climate policies. It has really been clear for all to see the brutality of corporate power and the profit driven agenda. Another interesting place we are also seeing it is in the colonization of international development. Um, it has been the, the fact that corporate power continues to create the challenges we face today, uh, especially in a capitalist system where money is seen as power. But now in the current chronically underfunded UN with public universities and research facilities starving for funds, money means more power than we have ever imagined. And so we have seen how that has played out in the vaccine inequalities. And so with the ability 
to pour endless resources to these vital sectors, corporations have slowly but steadily gained the power to drive development in its preferred directions and to wage unprecedented influence over public policy states and, inter and international institutions. The second um, point I would highlight um, before talking about how we are seeing it in the African context is the issue of techno solutionism or greenwashing. Uh, and I think a lot of movements call it false solutions, right? So because of the power of transnational corporations having overwhelming impacts in our globalized world, we have also seen them actively and persistently blocking the real solutions to address the overlapping crisis, both in the COVID crisis, but also in the climate crisis. And so this, how this happens is that um, corporations, transnational corporations come together, develop uh, technology solutions to global problems, then these are delivered, uh, these are lobbied through reduced regulation for the technologies that they have invented or developed, and then they commercialize the solution. And then this goes into the delivered, uh, is delivered into the waiting hands of the private sector. So, um, so sorry to the interpreters <laughs> that I'm speaking fast. I'm gonna slow down. Um, and so what we are seeing, for example, is what they call climate smart adaptation being advanced by fossil fuel industries who are keen on addressing climate change with more technological solutions. But this in its very essence is to ensure that it doesn't compromise their profits. And so these well-documented pro-corporate agendas are also really problematic, but also especially mean that the language of humanitarianism, global development, even equality and justice, ultimately serve the purpose of private profits and market expansion into more and more global South countries. And as feminists, we do know the danger of false solutions. Um, and this is something that we should definitely push back to because by falsely reducing the gravity of the climate crisis to a technical problem that can be addressed as green economy or blue economy or you know, climate smart mitigation, then the gravity of climate change and ecological colonialism is deeply depoliticized. Now, um, when, we, when we talk about how disaster capitalism is seducing our global South leaders, we know that the climate crisis, for example, is emerging from the interlocking system of capitalism, resource extraction, labor exploitation, um, settler colonialism, the commodi commodification of nature, and like you said, Priyanthi, militarism and imperialism. And so once we can appreciate that uh, climate crisis has its roots in the exploitation of enslaved people, then we can see that uh, you know, the global injustice of climate crisis will continue to play out on people from the global south, both in terms of consequences, but also in terms of intervention. When we look at the dominant development interventions, they typically reinforce um, indebtedness, inequalities and social exclusion of the global south. Um, an example is that in July of this year, 2021, the African Union released a green recovery action plan for the continent in the context of COVID-19 and climate change. And now in this action plan, they actually, the AU actually acknowledges how COVID-19 has exposed the way that debt restricts the scope of African governments in financing people-centered development and the way it exerts increasing pressure on governments to exploit nature for economic returns, irrespective of biodiversity and climate change ambitions. Finance capital has become a key driver of ecological and social devastation. And so for us, um, I think it's critical to ensure that African countries have access to finance on sustainable and fair terms, um, not only for targeted conservation and climate related investments, but as we have seen for related investments in public goods, including functioning health systems um, and, and research systems. And then finally, and I think very importantly, is that it's not only governments that need access to appropriate finance. Um, people, communities actually need access to this finance to build local solutions, especially in the context of this ecological crisis. Um, thank you so much, Priyanthi. And thank you, uh, fellow chief, because I think that reads, leads very um, clearly into my last question to the three of you. And maybe you can start by responding. You talked about uh, uh, techno solutions and how they are obscuring uh, the real issues behind uh, both uh, the climate crisis and what is actually 
um, what actually the causes and the drivers, uh, which as someone has said in the chat, uh, where capitalism is the real pandemic. Uh, so I was just wondering, I, I do not know that much about the Green New Deal, but what are solutions you talked about, uh, the green economies, blue economies. So what is this Green New Deal and will it serve uh, global South countries, or is that another bit of greenwash? Uh, fellow Jane, yourself, you maybe you can kind of continue that trend of thought. Okay, 100%. Thank you so much. So the Green New Deal, um, and I think we also need to be wary about all these terms that are always thrown up uh, at us, uh, and, and I think it's, it's really good, Priyanti, that you raise this about how do we continue to engage with the green new deals, the blue economy, the green economies, and all these models that always come up. Um, but the green new deal is actually signposting a growing political consensus on the need to urgently respond to the climate crisis. Now, this presents us with an opportunity to fundamentally rethink the forms of development based on neoliberal capitalism that have essentially underpinned the current pandemic. Um, in addition to the concern presently by a lot of us in the global south, that it is quite global north led. Uh, a lot of eco feminist and environmental justice organizations are actually sounding the alarm on how the US and EU New Green Deal proposals hinge on green financialization. So I'm going to expand on this just a little bit. So today, decades after the former colonies achieved their independence as nation states, neoliberal economic ideology still deploys the state to serve the market. And this is through international institutions in balanced rules and normally see this in trade, in negotiations, in policy norms and legal protections. Now, when we look at the Green New Deal and what is being positioned and becoming aware of how the market operates, then we can actually question and, and, and advance that you know, development based on neoliberal capitalism will never ever serve the interests of the global South. Addressing health pandemics and climate change in the global South countries can really not be delinked from building strong economies, building feminist economies, food systems, ecological integrity, and these have to be grounded in the combined needs of nature and the people. I think some of the inspiring examples that we get uh, of alternatives in terms of um, how we can address the climate crisis is what we are seeing with the women farmers in a group called Musom La Solution. We are the solution. And what they do is that they build and continue to build an agroecological movement that is building local economies, that is feeding communities, that is building seed sovereignty, mitigating climate change, and most importantly, amplifying the knowledge of women farmers across Africa. The, the rallying call and the overarching message in this and that they advance is that Northern globalized industrial food systems cannot be the aspiration underpinning the transformation of African food systems in the context of ecological crisis. But we also know that to create space for these alternatives, we require strategies to push back, to reject and to prohibit um, some of these logics of commodification, of extractivism, and of being creative with solutions, right? And not actually addressing the root and driving causes of the ecology. However, I appreciate the work that is being done by the Feminist Coalition on the Green New Deal. And that's a, an excellent place for a lot of people, a lot of us to start, um, where they articulate a set, a set of 10 advocacy messages for the US Green New Deal, really pushing for a decolonized um, you know, feminist approach into how we go about this Green New Deal. Um, and so maybe also my, wrap, my closing remarks, because I imagine I won't have enough time. One hour is quite short, Priyanki, <laughs> for some of these important issues. I would like to say that, you know, given the prevailing inequalities that we are seeing and the development models that we are seeing, we have seen that um, if we don't change it, if we do not build a new, if we don't build different, these models will continue to serve the few at the expense of the many whether it's in vaccine inequalities, whether it's in the climate crisis, whether it's in an economic crisis. And so it is really, really critical that we confront the dominant development interventions, particularly those that reinforce indebtedness, inequalities, and social equation. So thank you so much, and uh, looking forward to hearing my co-panelists' interventions as well. 
Thank you so much. I think we might still have a chance for you to have a last word later. But uh, can I just uh, ask Mela whether she would like to add to what fellow Jean has said, uh, especially about, I think fellow Jean, you presented the challenges, but also gave us some hope uh, by sharing uh, what uh, women are doing. Uh, so I would like Mela to maybe add to that. Uh, thank you very much, fellow Jean, and uh, thank you, Priyanti. Um, I think, uh, as mentioned by, by fellow Jean, that um, women are, are organizing um, uh, around the injustices that they are facing. And uh, I, I would like to go back to the, to the four solutions. And, and always I, I always would like to bring in uh, the indigenous and peace and, and working class women's perspectives around that, that you, you see um, the solutions being offered, particularly looking at Africa, because a lot of the food that we consume in Africa, it is produced by subsistence farmers, uh, particularly for countries like Zimbabwe, where uh, research in 2019 indicated that 70% of the grain is produced at subsistence level, but there's so much emphasis around, we would like to uh, build the commercial agriculture sector, which is a challenge in the sense that, um, um, I, I will just give you an example of, you know, women resisting the so-called early maturing seed varieties. And across Africa, women are coming up with seed banks to, to protect their indigenous seeds. And for me, this is uh, uh, a fight, a women's, an African women's fight uh, against um, uh, the taking over of, of, um, of, uh, of the food industry by corporations. It is a challenge to capitalism in the sense that you see one of the, one of the women I was talking to of the, of the peasant uh, farmers was saying to me, you see, we are being given these seeds as handouts, but firstly, we don't understand them. And then what will happen if we, uh, we, if we do away with our seeds? And then uh, these people who are giving us for free start selling uh, these seeds to us. What will happen if we don't have money to buy? And for me, this is something which I said as African women, women in the global South, this is a space that we should support the resistance, the resistance of taking over of food systems in the guise of climate solutions that women uh, would like to have control. Women are talking about not losing control over how the, the food is produced, and uh, who is producing that food for, 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 for their families, for their countries, and as well the quality of the, of the food being produced. And there's so much information. People are bombarded everywhere uh, with false uh, corporate driven solutions on climate change. And I, I, have, I, I have interacted with some with some um, uh, uh, forest people in, in the Diara Congo in, in Uganda who were resisting uh, um, uh, the, 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 the trees which are uh, exotic, which are brought in as, you know, we need to, to have forests, we need to rehabilitate our forests. And, you know, when, when we hear about this resistance of, you know, um, People do not, people are against the, 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 the planting of trees. For me, it sounded so weird when I read something about uh, the, the, the indigenous people, the peasants are, are, are against planting trees. And the question which came to my mind is what, what kind of trees are these? And I, I, I visited one of the places in, in Uganda where I saw um, the types of trees which were coming from, from abroad, which are, I would say, very colonizing in nature, creating green deserts, 
which suck all the water from 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 the from the ground and which are not sustainable for the for the local people and then i say to myself you know people love their forests but they do not want the artificial forests the trees which are being brought in by corporations and at first these are brought in as donations right and which are which are killing all these other plant life and then uh, people are against having uh, just one um, a, a type of tree and call that a forest so I said also, um, uh, we were talking the other time with other um, uh, African ecofeminists and talking about how the struggles um, uh, uh, against mono agriculture should be supported. We, we do not want um, uh, uh, one plant species, a whole forest with one plant species. We would like the indigenous forests to be protected. And then looking at how even uh, the regulations around COVID were extremely capitalist, were corporate driven, and our governments, yeah. like what fellow Jean has, has mentioned, that they um, subscribe, they ad adopt these policies because they so much would like aid. And uh, for, 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 for me, it is also how uh, whilst we have faith in the Green New Deal, but it is not talking about the colonial injustices that Africa and the global South are still living with. You know, African countries inherited colonial debts and these debts have been ballooning and then how these debts are impacting on the lives of African women, how labor continues to be extracted uh, from Africa, how the role of Africa and other countries in the global South has been perfected into the suppliers of raw materials for countries in the global North. For me, it is this injustice which has to be addressed of whilst we, we can say that, oh, we, that there, is no, um, there is no slavery anymore, there is no colonialism, but as we can see right now how this has mutated, taking in a new form uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the form of, you know, uh, we do have reforms, how capitalism is reforming itself so that it becomes more, uh, uh, more acceptable. And, and as we could see the rescue packages that a lot of governments across the world were presenting as, you know, we need to make sure that economies are revived after uh, the pandemic, how the, 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 the plight of the, the, the women, the peasants, the, the, the working class, they were pushed to the periphery, how there were no packages for the women who are largely working in the less formal sector and how even in, in countries like Zimbabwe women's movement, it was um, uh, restricted under lockdowns, under curfews, women facing extreme violence, how the, 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 the women's um, our, our food production, how it was not considered as essential. And the question for me was, how can uh, uh, whole governments sit down and say the farmer, the woman farmer is not essential when we all have to eat food? And how does it work that this chain supermarket is suddenly uh, 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 um, uh, essential? How does that work? And then I see how this marginalization of, 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 of um, women's production processes, how also, and, and, and uh, maybe lastly, before I stop, just also thinking through about how the knowledge also is extracted, how what constitutes knowledge usually comes from the global south, is packaged, go to the global north and comes back 
as, as, as knowledge and how the violence on the indigenous knowledge systems that uh, uh, um, is largely held by women is bastardized in favor of uh, uh, what is coming uh, from the global north and not only coming from the, everyone in the global north, but coming from the patriarchs, uh, from the white patriarchs in the global north, how they are the ones who are considered the knowers as having the solutions, as, as uh, 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 having even uh, when people are talking about transitioning into, um, into a, a climate just, environmental just, and gender just solutions, how this also is largely coming from the global north with the voices uh, from the global south, women's voices in the global south are, are, are being silenced in search for the, for the alternatives. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mela. Uh, I think, I mean, I'm a little bit overwhelmed by, by the questions that I have asked actually and your answers to them. Uh, because I, as Mar Marissa has put in the chat, capitalism has created markets and products and seized natural resources and robbed indigenous people of their right, rights and their, and of, as you pointed out, and many people have pointed out during this forum of their indigenous knowledge, which is which is vital for the survival of the planet um, and created. And a lot of this happens very insidiously. It happens as though it is the only way or the, these solutions are the only 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 path. And this is also uh, a way in which sort of governments have kind of it has kind of uh, osmo uh, it is kind of osmosis that governments have just kind of absorbed these solutions right and so i was just wondering whether kavita you uh, you could speak to some of maybe some of the as Felogene and amela have done there have been resistance and uh, within uh, communities to this have there been uh, what has what has been happening in the Asia and the Pacific regions, uh, similar resistance, and maybe we could then have a final last word about how we could scale up this resistance so that it becomes a more uh, global kind of uh, uh, global resistance to the the system. That's a hard question, Priyanthi, but I'll try my best. <laughs> I think, you know, fundamentally, I think we all recognize that without wealth redistribution, it is a failing fight, whether it's trying to address the COVID crisis or the climate crisis. So it's really imperative for those of us in, in, in the movements and the circles that we work in, that we recognize the injustices and how they manifest itself. So the global green new deal again is a eurocentric package that's now being imposed on the global south and it's not just the global new deal there's there's a few of this that's you know floating around there's the build back better you know that we're hearing over and over again again where is it coming from we've got um the great reset again who is it benefiting so ultimately what we find and as i was sharing earlier is through this entire period, um, all we've seen is that the billionaires are getting richer, poverty, violence, and the climate crisis is getting worse. And you know, we've got institutions like the military industrial complex that you know, the, the spending on the military industrial complex is 2 billion and it's increasing in the face of our existing crises. So we really have to understand where is the money and where is it going to? And how do we fundamentally change that system? Um, so we have the solutions, but it will not work as long as the overarching framework of dominance, power and wealth is unevenly distributed and held within the elites of the global north and the elites of the global south 
you know, tax havens have 36 trillion hidden. Um, and there is no regulation around, you know, how that money can be um, monitored or where's the accountability for it or where that money even comes from. And here we have governments in the global south, even some in the global north, scrambling to find funds so that they can start implementing, you know, environmental safeguards or gender equality or in our parts of the world, building hospitals, making sure girls get an education. But the problem is, and, and, and you know, this, this hope that the Green Climate Fund um, will suddenly have $100 billion that will be equally distributed to the global south. I mean, let's just be real. It, it hasn't happened in the last, since 2014. Is it going to happen in the current circumstances? And why are we relying on the benevolence of the private sector to suddenly start funding these things? Because they won't. Instead, what they're pushing forward are these other false solution packages, which, you know, Mela and, and fellow Jean have both highlighted with, with case studies out of Africa. It's the same in our region. We are being sold false packages. There is deliberately ignoring our current global economic system where wealth, we, we spend 2.2 trillion just servicing debt and through our exploited labor, through our commodities, that has not changed and that is not changing so now to impose these other green new deals without and you know the the, the point that mela wrote um uh, said about you know just just the unpaid labor of women and this is something i wrote about does the green new deal actually capture the the 11 trillion dollars that is actually the value of unpaid labor of women in the global south it doesn't what the Green, Global Green New Deal and these other packages do is, is offering to impose greater burdens as long as the unpaid labor of women remain where it is. We're not talking about building more social infrastructure to redistribute care work. We're not talking about um, canceling debt, really just canceling debt. Most of this debt is just historical injustices. You know, the governments, the global North governments aren't even funding the Green Climate Fund, much less really meeting their ODAs to us. And now to sell uh, green technologies or renewable energy technology transfers so that the economies in the global South transition, when the reality is, what would that transition mean? What does just transition mean in the global South? I mean, global South is is, is where we've got an informal sector that is huge, you know, an informal sector that does not recognize and protect labor rights, that does not recognize and protect environment and, and, and social safeguards because of, you know, structural adjustment requirements and everything else that's been imposed through this unjust trade and investment regime. So what we really need to do in terms of where we are in our activism is to dismantle that system and how do we do it? What's required to dismantle that system and also then really implement what we know are just an alternative solutions. Latin America has come up with the eco-social pact. What is our counter to what's being imposed? Because this is the time, this is probably the only time we have to really challenge everything that's Eurocentric and coming from the global North because fundamentally, it is a means to benefit the global north elites and not the global south. They benefit by keeping us trapped in debt, extracting our commodities and labor through this unjust trade and investment regime. It works for them, which is why these packages don't talk about these things, right? Renewable technologies are working great in the global north, but what does that actually mean for the global south? So these are some of those fundamental questions that we really need to ask ourselves and how we mobilize, how we resource our mobilized movements and what do we need to do is, is I think the crux of how we really challenge what's happening. Now, are there any first steps that you have seen happen in the Asia and the Pacific regions towards that? So I think, for us, it's a long term struggle. So the work that I do around feminist participatory action research, which is really, you know, building the knowledge, sharing information in a way that is understood by grassroots women, so that they're able to engage in policy making spaces from the local grassroots community level 
all the way, way up into national, regional and international spaces to influence policy, to hold their governments accountable, to, to come up with campaigns on demanding feminist climate justice is what I find working best, which is building the movements to resist the monopoly of corporate capture. Um, and, and governments really not fulfilling their rights um, as, as, as rights holders. So, but, but again, the challenge is we're, we're in the global South where, where our governments, and, and this is an answer to your question about how the global South governments are being seduced. Most of our governments are corrupt. Our political leaders are shocking. You know, there is a, there's a democratic crisis happening across the region. Wars and conflicts are going to intensify as our resources are being depleted. You know, climate displacement and migration is a huge issue in the global South. Again, these are not, um, these are only discussed and talked about at G7 and NATO and all these other summits, but really the voices of even the global South leaders in this space is completely diminished because power and wealth is controlled entirely by the global North. And so for me, I think fundamentally that transfer of power needs to return to the people. It really needs to return to the people. And that's grassroots people in our region. We don't have time to start explaining the Paris Agreement and all of this to our grassroots people that we work with and we work for. We just have to go in there and fight hard. And, and really it starts with holding our governments accountable, making the right political choices and resisting all these global north solutions and technologies that are just infiltrating um, our, our regions and which the governments are just buying out because obviously they make profit out of it themselves, right? Thank you, Kavita. Um, I would just now, we have three minutes left, I think, of our time. And I really want to thank all three of you for such fabulous insights and uh, um, yeah, and of kind of raising these issues. I think we have a whole day of talking about uh, various aspects of, of uh, this situation, but thank you for setting the scene. I, in the last couple of minutes, I would like to ask um, Mela and then fellow Jean to just say, uh, uh, to talk to how we can actually move forward, because I think what we have we started with disaster capitalism, and then maybe we are ending with capitalism as a disaster in itself. So I think, uh, Mela, first you, and then maybe fellow Jane after. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Akavita, for bringing in our feminist participatory action research, which actually shifts power uh, from the mainstream knowledge systems, taking it back to the to the to the to the women, and I would like to just uh, uh, also add on to um, uh, one of the solutions being the the, the 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 raising of critical consciousness, which is actually embedded in feminist participatory action research and feminist popular education, using such empowering processes to define what the alternative, the feminist uh, economies should look like. And also just um, um, having solidarity networks, networks of, of solidarity with the, with the working class indigenous groups uh, uh, in the global South as well as uh, in, in the global North. And uh, I think uh, the solutions lies with upholding the indigenous knowledges that uh, are being held by the peace and women, by, by uh, uh, the indigenous groups, and also that that is actually knowledge that is legitimate. I will uh, hand over to fellow Jean. Thank you very much. Excellent. And thank you, Mela, for that 100% agreed. Um, I think just three things. One, debt moratoriums and cancellations are critical for the restructuring of our economies not just debt as we are currently seeing it, but ecological debt, like Kavita so beautifully put it, um, that is rooted in historical inequalities and colonialism and injustices. Then secondly, the addressing of the crisis that we are failing needs to centrally um, appreciate the interconnections, be it between climate change, um, industrialized agriculture, the extractive development, and particularly their roles in just putting us in this endless cycle of you know, social inequalities, political instability, and food insecurity. 
Similarly, that also puts us as feminists to build our interconnections. We, can, we need to build stronger interconnections between our, the very struggles that we face, um, both, global, both transnational solidarity, but also in terms of the issues that we work on. And then finally, I think I just wanted to say something about resilience. I think we need to be very critical about how we deploy language when we're talking about um, some of these terms. I totally agree that you know, we do not have time Neither is it the best use of our energy to start explaining about IPCC, because I think this is also how capitalism and neoliberal ideologies keep us working and tired so that we are not focusing on the real issues, but also just rejecting this idea that resilience um, being offered as a permanent solution is very, very problematic, because what it then does is just keep us in a permanent state of oppression. And so how do we advance solutions that are actually addressing the root systemic existential crises that we are facing globally is really, really crucial for this climate moment and discussions. So thank you so much. Thank you so much to all three of you. Uh, as you've probably seen in the chat, I think people really appreciate how you raised the issues as well as provided, as someone said, some gentle solutions. Uh, so thank you again uh, for being with us. And I would, Hope that you can be with us at other points in the rest of today. Um, and with that, I'd like to close this with a big thank you to again to all of you and to all the participants and to all our uh, interpreters to whom we hope we didn't give too hard a time. Uh, thank you again. Bye, everyone. Have a good day.